you so much. So I'm going to talk for about um, an hour, um, and then we have a few minutes for questions then. Um, and I'm going to be talking today about the Soviet avant-garde of the 1920s. And thank you, all of you, for coming. And thank you to Ali uh, for inviting me. Um, uh, it, you know, I, I, this is material that I totally love. There's this incredible flowering of the human imagination in this period in the 1920s, a flower that unfortunately where the, the, the blossom would be absolutely crushed under the heel of Stalin in the 1930s. And I feel like it's a, a time that is uh, sort of very emotionally inspiring to see what people were dreaming of and the way that they could reimagine their world in this period. So I'm going to tell you the stories of individuals and share with you some of their work to give you a taste. First, poets, then visual artists, musicians, and then uh, finally novelists. Um, there's just so many fantastic creators with incredible stories from this period. And I just want to give you at least an idea of the riches that there are in this fascinating decade in the USSR um, in its first years. And I, there is a, um, an annotated bibliography that I handed out. Um, if uh, I'm not sure that there were enough for everyone. Um, there weren't? OK. So uh, write to Grace um, if uh, you don't, didn't get one. And I'm not going to supply her with one. I just want you to really bug Grace instead of me. Um, but uh, yeah, so she, Grace can send it to you if you, if you uh, do not have one and would like one. This is a bibliography just to kind of like, uh, if you want to do sort of further reading on your own, um, this gives some suggestions. I also have books over there that I brought uh, if you want to take a look at some of the things that are, that are being discussed. Uh, today. All right, so why am I telling this story? Why am I bothering to tell this story? And I feel like there are a few reasons. Number one, there's just incredible music, art, and writing that deserves to be heard or to be seen or to be read in this period. And number two, I feel like if this movement had not been crushed in the way that it was so brutally, we would see the whole history of culture in the 20th century differently. We would see the birth of modernism happening in Russia every bit as much as um, we do see it in, so like, you know, um, in the abstract expressionists of the, in New York City or, you know, that kind of thing. It would change the story we told about the 20th century. Um, third, I feel like this is an example of how deeply important the arts are to today's to, to a society's understanding of itself, to any society's understanding of itself, how deeply important. Um, number four, there's an urgency about this work. This work is written in extreme circumstances and is about the kind of the, the deepest parts of us as human animals. And that kind of urgency is really missing, I feel like, from the American conversation right now. And in a way, we need to understand um, the extremity that people uh, go through sometimes. And finally, just we're, you know, we're in a situation now where we look at Russia and say, what is Russia about? Why is Russia doing what it's doing? And I think a lot of the answers you know, reach back, well back into the 20th century. So it's strange that Russia was the, one of the birthplaces of the modern sense on the eve of the revolution. It was incredibly backward. Um, the literacy rate was awful. I mean, most of the population was illiterate, which is not surprised if you think, surprising if you think about the vastness of the Russian Empire on the eve of the revolution. I mean, when I, when I say Russia just before the revolution, we kind of immediately picture St. Petersburg, which is this very European-style city. You know, um, Pushkin, the poet, even called it like the window on the west. And we picture this sort of like the Tolstoy and, uh, you know, the uh, Tolstoyan idea of St. Petersburg, the city with balls and people in black tie and blah, blah, blah. But remember that actually most of Russia is just hundreds of thousands of miles of steppe. It is Kazakh nomads who have literally never heard the name of the Tsar that rules over them. It is villages uh, that are using medieval farming techniques. So one of the writers I'll talk about today, Boris Pilniak, writes about what it's like in a small village uh, which is being collectivized. And um, you know, when, the, this, uh, when this Marxist guy arrives there, they still are doing the first plowing of the season, having a naked widow pull the plow with two virgins walking behind her because that will ensure the, um, the fertility of the fields. So that's, so the communists, 
Uh, yeah, right, well, yeah, so get working, ladies. So um, um, the communists uh, decided that they were going to, for better or for worse, yank Russia, pull Russia, kicking and screaming, into a new century. And the two revolutions of 1917, that is to say the February and October revolution, those were set to change all of this, to project it into the future. It was a very heady and exciting time. Here is Lenin on the subject of the arts, and it's a, a kind of a beautiful sentiment. He writes, art belongs to the people. It must have its deepest roots in the broad masses of the workers. It must be understood and loved by them. It must be rooted in and grow with their feelings, thoughts, and desires. It must arouse and develop the artist in them. Are we to give cake and sugar to a minority when the mass of workers and peasants still lack black bread? So that art may come to the people and the people to art, we must first of all raise the general level of education and culture. So it's a really great sentiment. Of course, his actual approach to the arts was somewhat more complicated than that, but that's the kind of sentiment that people were drunk on in this period. That's what they were being fed as the idea of this is the government's notion of the arts. Um, in the days before the revolution, starting around 1910, revolutionary artists were already talking about throwing away the culture of the feudal past and the bourgeois past and the creation of something new, something entirely new. So here, for example, is the, uh, sorry, I think that the, we established that the clicker isn't working, right? Yeah, so I'm gonna have to uh, come over here to do this. The f here is the future, the futurist Velimir Hlebnikov's 1916 declaration called A Slap in the Face of Public Taste. And he declares that he has, quote, the right to everything, including the Milky Way. Noise of ages, get out of the way. Long rule the sound of discontinuous epochs. All who are closer to death than to birth must surrender. They will drop dead in the war of epochs when we assault like savages. We are calling you to a country where the trees speak, where scientific unions resemble the waves, a country of springtime armies of love, where time blossoms like a bird cherry tree and moves like a piston, where a man in a carpenter's apron saws epochs into boards and like a lathe operator treats his own tomorrow. We are going to that country and suddenly someone dead, some skeleton, grabs us and tries to stop us from shedding the feathers of this imbecilic today. How is that fair? Keep your skeletal hands off yesterday. <laughs> so this is a movement of youth, of the future, of fantasy, of science fiction, of destruction of the past. Um, on the walls of the Proletkult building, the big uh, propaganda building, was written the words, in the name of our tomorrow, burn Raphael to ashes, destroy museums, trample down the flowers of art. The futurist poet, um, Vladimir Mayakovsky, whoops, um, wrote, the streets are our brushes, the squares are our palettes. Drag the pianos out onto the streets, spit on rhymes and arias, and the rose bush, and other such mawkishness from the arsenal of the arts. Give us new forms. So this was actually literally true. They, the pianos of the bourgeoisie were actually being dragged out onto the streets. They were being loaded into, um, into flatbed trucks, driven to factories where people were playing concerts. For factory workers, there was this idea, we're going to bring the arts to everyone. Tremendously exciting. Um, this was a period also of street uh, performances, very much, in fact, like Bread and Puppet. Things where, so, like I, I've seen photographs, you have these sort of like people playing capitalists with sort of giant paper mache heads, like stomping around, or, or like, or feudalists, you know, um, stomping around, and then, you know, then there comes along a, um, a parade of all the vegetables grown in the Ukraine or something. It's a, you know, so there are a lot of these kind of public drama spectacles and that kind of thing. Literally, as Mayakovsky said, making the streets into the, the canvases. Um, Mayakovsky is, in fact, kind of the poster child for the revolutionary avant-garde at first. Um, by age 12, he was stealing rifles for the Bolsheviks. Um, he very quickly moved on. He became, uh, he was very handsome. He was very loud. 
He was very seductive. Um, in memoirs of the futurists, uh, they have him at parties and performances wearing this sort of top hat with modernist face paint in sort of like cubist designs on his face, absurdist costumes. And uh, he became weirdly the kind of the spokesperson for uh, Soviet art. In 1914 and 1915, before the revolution, he wrote one of his most famous poems, which is called A Cloud in Trousers. Um, the plot, which is kind of irrelevant, is that he's waiting for a somewhat indifferent woman that he's in love with in a hotel lobby. And while he bickers with her, he gradually assumes the role of a futurist messiah and then kills God. Um, so I guess it's a bad date. But um, the original name of the four parts, the four sections of the poem were down with your love, down with your art, down with your regime, and down with your religion. So you can feel the kind of the youthful burning anger of this. And remember, though, that the arts had been the province of the ruling class. So when you're looking at this and thinking it sounds kind of uh, um, horrifically aggressive, this idea of destruction of art, remember that it's being said by people who've only seen art through windows. You know, they've only seen art in houses where they are serving or in houses where they are working in the fields. So the idea is this kind of like class anger, which I think is very, very real. Now, here are a few excerpts from this poem um, chosen. Uh, it's, it's a reasonably long poem, but these are just a few short excerpts to give you a sense of what uh, the cloud in trousers is like. And you'll see for him the... Uh, the revolutionary movement is very tied up with his own youth and vigor. There is no grandfatherly fondness in me. There are no gray hairs in my soul. Shaking the world with my voice and grinning, I pass you by, handsome 22-year-old. Glorify me. The great ones are no match for me. Upon everything that's been done, I stamp the word not. As of now, I have no desire to read. Novels? So what? This is how books are made, I used to think. Along comes a poet and opens his lips with ease. Inspired, the fool simply begins to sing. Oh, please. <laughs> From all of you who soaked in love for plain fun, whoops, uh, who spilled tears into centuries while you cried, I'll walk away and place the monocle of the sun into my gaping wide open eye. I'll wear colorful clothes, the most outlandish, and roam the earth to please and scorch the public. And in front of me on a metal leash, Napoleon will run like a little puppy. Like a woman quivering, the earth will lie down, wanting to give in, she will slowly slump. Things will come alive, and from all around, their lips will lisp, yum. Yum, yum, yum. <laughs> so once again, you have this theme, like in these sort of the, uh, those, um, the uh, political writing of the period of the destruction of the old. And you have the politics of that obviously being very bound up with, atta with an attack of youth on age. There are pretty strong hints of what will become a major instability in Mayakovsky's work and life, which is that his view of the revolution is incredibly bound up with his own egotism and narcissism, which um, is kind of a contradiction if you're talking about a collective society, right? But you also can start to hear, and I know I only read a small portion of it, you can start to hear some of the elements of poetry that become central to the poetic movement in the 1920s. So the use of this kind of broken, new, bold language. There's a use of slang in the original. There are echoes of street grammar rather than sort of good poetic grammar. There's the use of slogans and brand names and headlines. There are extravagant, wild, dreamlike metaphors like using the sun as a monocle or walking Napoleon on a leash. Um, these kinds of things will be hallmarks of a lot of the new Soviet writing of re revolution. So the idea was art is no longer for museums and palaces. It's now for use. So there's an emphasis, for example, on poster art, where the kind of the cubist forms that are at the cutting edge of art right around 1920 suddenly become illustration, uh, you know, the, the building blocks of illustration for this sort of this public art that is hung on walls, everyone can use it, that kind of thing. Um, 
Here, for example, is one of Mayakovsky's own posters. Um, he wrote the text, Rodchenko did the uh, illustration, um, and this uh, is a, um, an advertisement for pacifiers. The, um, <laughs> what this says is, no better pacifiers. Never have been. You'll suck on them till you're old. <laughs> and, but what I think is interesting is like, you know, the baby's hands look more like pistol shots than they do like hands. The pacifiers themselves really look a lot like, uh, more like hand grenades where someone's pulling out the pin before throwing it. So there, could, there is nothing pacifistic about these pacifiers. <laughs> yeah, this is also a period when, um, when children's books were il written by the greatest writers, illustrated by the greatest uh, painters, because there was an idea that, um, that these, this is how you should engage with the public as an artist. Um, and in fact, so I brought a book called Inside the Rainbow. If you're interested, you can go look at it afterwards about children's book art uh, during this period. And then also, um, Barbara brought a book from this period uh, about Baba Yaga that uh, illustrates exactly the kind of stuff I'm talking about, if you want to take a look afterwards. Um, oh, Mayakovsky did, a child did some children's books. Here he is uh, appearing in his own children's book, of course. Um, in the same way that he uh, put on a play called um, Mayakovsky, starring Mayakovsky, with uh, Mayakovsky as the main character. Um, this book is perhaps a little more acceptable to modern audiences than his classic, Let Us Take the New Rifles, um, another uh, picture book for kids. I don't know if you can see, but over here, uh, it appears that um, it really is only fun until someone loses an eye. Um, so. This is a fantastic period for Russian art as great futurist artists experimented with new erupted forms, these things that are geometrical and abstract, and as they often applied themselves to items for use, like these children's books or like textiles, um, like ceramics, like housewares, like architecture. And uh, is it Sally Smith? Was that? Yes, yeah, Sally Smith actually brought a, uh, a book that, um, about uh, Melnikov, who was one of the great experimental Soviet ar architects. And uh, so once again, if you want to come over and take a look at that afterwards, you can see the sort of the excitement of this thing about like, only a generation ago, we were building palaces with columns. Now, look at this. You know, there's this kind of this revolutionary sense to it all. And the idea is that art had to be useful to the people no longer locked away in those coral palaces. And the people would rise to be excited by these new artistic forms of the future, these splintered forms and cubist reimaginings of space. So there were all these movements that swirled around, actually quite hard to distinguish now, called things like suprematism and rayonism. Here's uh, a few examples. Uh, electricity by Natalia Goncharova, um, as always, anything that smacks of modernity, like electricity, which most people in Russia do not have yet, though frankly, to be fair, most people in Vermont did not have either at this period, so um, anyway, um, that it's, there's, there's that real ethos there. Or one of my favorites is this artist, El Lisitsky, um, who does all of these kind of geometri geometrical abstractions. This is called Fight the White with the Red Wedge, this is, this is a Civil War poster. The idea is the whites are the people who are still supporting the old government of the Tsar. The reds are the Bolsheviks. And here is the red literally plunging into uh, the heart of whiteness. Um, so that as geometry fights it out, as color fights it out, uh, you know, also poli the political forces are fighting all over the country. And El Lissitzky also did children's books. This is a very, very, they're very, very wonderful and strange. Here you see actually the alphabet, the words themselves become the illustration. The line between text and art actually has dissolved. So you, and the line also between text and geometry, suddenly letters are their own geometrical forms. So all of it is, is seen as one. It's a very, very kind of exciting, bold, strange. Uh, if you imagine that just um, you know, uh, 10 or 15 years before, like Ilya Repin and like the great like realist painters are painting, suddenly you have this explosion of, of this kind of thing. It's very exciting. Um, also in the visual field, 
uh, one of the most exciting things was uh, this guy, Zevalold Meyerhold, who was a theater producer. And he was hiring all these modernist writers and modernist um, painters to do his sets and to write his plays. So Mayakovsky wrote plays for him. He had these, um, these bizarre modernist sets. And keep in mind, this is the same period that Stanislavski, of the Stanislavski method, you know, the idea that you're supposed to kind of like, um, you know, a Stanislavski show would be one where the idea is if it takes place in a country house, the set looks exactly like a room in a country house. And all the people who are playing servants but who never speak have been told that they need to make up a backstory about their character so that they can still have depth as a servant standing at attention throughout the scene. And in, uh, you know, in contradiction to that, here is Meyerhold who is like, none of the sets look like everything. They look like abstract geometrical shapes, like on these posters, like in this art. Um, none of the people, the people are all very flattened. Um, for example, when, um, when Meyerhold put on Chekhov's plays, he decided that people fainted a lot in those plays. So he actually cut out everything but the fainting. He called the play 33 Swoons, and he just had people swoon, and then someone played on the piano a little fanfare for each character who swooned. He had cars running around on stage. Remember, cars are like mind-blowing at this period. Walls moved, or they were made out of swaying bamboo stalks, or he had slogans projected on the back by Lenin and Marx and the Association of Chemical Defense. Um, the writer Bulgakov, who wrote uh, Master and Margarita, he once uh, joked that he thought that um, Meyerhold was so experimental that he was eventually going to die crushed under a pile of naked thespians. <laughs> um, his, um, his most famous play was probably The Bed Bug, which is a kind of post, uh, uh, which is a uh, dystopian story about a guy who wakes up, who's frozen and wakes up in a, in a very bleak future. Um, this was actually undertaken by the kind of dream team of modernism. So here is Meyerhold, the uh, director. Here is Mayakovsky, who wrote the play. Here is Rodchenko, who did the sets. And here is a very young Dmitry Shostakovich, who uh, wrote the music as a teenager. And he was, uh, he was actually living with Meyerhold and Meyerhold's wi wife, the actress Zineda Rake, and leaves us a kind of a very funny testament of what it was like being, living among the, um, the Futurists, which was basically Meyerhold and his wife, Zinaida, saying to each other, darling, you were wonderful. Oh, no, you're the wonderful one. You're a genius. No, you're the genius. So they, there's like, so Shostakovich is kind of like, it's sort of difficult living with a bunch of geniuses. Um, so it's, it's uh, this is a period of the fashionability of experiment, bringing the style of the avant-garde to the public and there's a lot of interdisciplinary experimentation, as with, say, like Picasso and the Surrealists in Paris. Um, it's the theater that is self-consciously theater of the future. Um, here are some of the, uh, the costumes for the bed bug. And you can see the influence of the visual art, obviously, on all this kind of thing. It all works together. So um, the final artist I'll, I'll just touch on is uh, Kazimir Malevich, who um, uh, was a, a kind of a Russian cubist, in a sense, an abstract cubist. Um, here, uh, he did paint a self-portrait, so we do know what he looked like. Um, <laughs> but um, he, um, uh, so he wrote, the thunder of the October cannons helped us to become innovative. We have come to burn the brain clean of the mildew of the past. So once again, remember, he's coming from this world where he's trained to do figure drawing and things. And suddenly, here's his most famous painting. It's called Black Square. It is a painting that doesn't welsh on its promises. Um, and uh, now the interesting thing is when I first was looking at his work, I assumed that it was very anti-human. I assumed that it was very much like very cold and like Humans are somehow geometrical and are somehow machines. The interesting thing is, with a lot of these artists, there's this interesting tension. For, um, for Malevich, Malevich, it was in, actually this painting in particular was incredibly spiritual. This is a really important surprising point. You have, on the one hand, this futurist sense of the human being like a machine, but on the other hand, a very Russian sense 
that all of this eruption of form was very modern, but very mystical too. So it's about the energies of God himself. For Malevich, the black square was not a negation of the human, but a mystical approach to something even more potently supernatural. And this makes sense if you actually see the black square where it was originally shown, where it is put in the corner, which is this is the position that would normally be occupied in a Russian house by a, Greek, by a Russian Orthodox icon. So this is, for him, an icon that reveals a tremendous kind of spirituality of, um, of spirituality of a kind of hidden, hidden blankness that leads you onwards to a greater spiritual fulfillment. And it's, this is very much like Kandinsky, who, um, uh, you know, once again, you have this kind of abstract uh, geometrical painting, but he himself wrote uh, literally a treatise called On the Spiritual and Art. He doesn't see this as being dehumanized. He sees it as being deeply, deeply fundamentally religious. And on, that, um, on the uh, bibliography I passed out, you can go read him for free online. His, we've his, got more copies. Oh, we've got more copies, too, if you want them. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, and, and Kandinsky, I should mention, was also the head of the, um, the art section at the People's Commissariat of Enlightenment, which was bringing a lot of this art to uh, the public. Um, so this is a subsumed disagreement that would eventually cause a collision. Is the revolution about the human as a soul or about the human as a cog? Stalin would later actually call faithful communist workers cogs. He wrote that writers and artists should be engineers of the human soul. Um, there is this kind of Marxist materialist idea of society as a machine. There, you know, for example, as you probably know, they were undergoing the destruction of churches, of mosques, of synagogues, the destruction of church bells in town squares, which come up in a lot of this work. There's this tension between the spiritual and the materialist in, in the avant-garde. And this is true in the visual arts, but also in writing and music. And I'm going to show you my or play for you my favorite example from uh, music, uh, which is by a um, composer named Nikolai um, Abukhov. Now, Abukhov, on the face of it, is very similar to the uh, to the sort of experimental artist we've looked at. He's experimenting with kind of atonal, 12-tone composition of a certain kind. Um, it's very angular and it's abstract in the same way that the visual art is. But it's actually, according to him, deeply spiritual. He was a musical mystic. He was Catholic. He, in fact, went by the alias Nicolas L'Ecstasy, Nicholas of the Ecstasy. He supposedly wrote the bar numbers of his music in his own blood. And performance indications for the performers include things like, with an unknown perfume, with an, uh, an enigmatic delirium. Um, they're all in French, too. With a, with a divine splendor. With clairvoyance. Play this with clairvoyance. Or to his singers, regretting with a hoarse voice. Convincing with an insane smile. With malignancy or suffering furiously. So um, I'm going to attempt now to actually uh, to play one minute of his of his music. Um, let's see if this works. Um, okay, and so this is uh, from a set of pieces called Revelation, and you'll hear that they have the same kind of crystalline feeling as the art of the period. It's not playing off of this, it's playing off your speakers. Uh. 
so you get an idea. Um, the um, sorry that we can't do anything about the uh, um, we can't do anything about the uh, um, volume. I apologize. Um, but anyway, um, so he um, what you hear there. I mean, it it's, has this kind of feeling of a kind of a. Woo. <laughs> Um, yeah, huh. Um, so um, it is, uh, so it has a kind of a crystalline feeling, very much like the paintings. There, it's a sort of, it's a kind of abstract geometry that is floating in white space. You literally have kind of periods of silence that are as important to set off the shapes that have been played on the piano as the, the sound. So it is literally like those El Lissitzky paintings. And once again, like some of those people, like Kandinsky, like Malevich, he sees this as being a deeply spiritual piece. Every piece in this set, Revelations, is about a different uh, spiritual element. Um, he uh, is best known, perhaps, for a piece that never was performed, um, which was to be called the Book of Life. It was supposed to be um, uh, performed only in a, um, in a uh, temple built by Natalia Goncharova, the futurist. And uh, the performance of it was going to bring the Tsar back from the dead and put him back in power. Um, so it was you know, a piece that the Soviet authorities weren't super into. So Obuchov found it necessary to flee the Soviet Union. Um, and he, left, uh, he you know, lived the rest of his life in the West. Um, so other Soviet futurist music focuses on mechanism and uh, machinery and speed. There are pieces called things like the electrification rag. Suicide by airplane, rails, communist youth are the boss of electrification, and iron foundry, the last of which is by this guy, um, Alexander Mosolov. And so my, for my other musical uh, piece, I'm going to play just about a minute of Mosolov's iron foundry. And this is a ballet that depicts an iron foundry. Um, and you should know that um, if you could see the orchestra actually playing, uh, at one point, the percussionists just take out a giant piece of sheet metal and start beating the crap out of it. You get the idea. OK, so um, once again, there's, an, there's a kind of an incredible joy in rhythm here, um, but an aggressive joy, a brutalist joy, parallel musically to the in-your-face declarations of the death of the past by Mayakovsky and Klebnikov. Um, but this music was incredibly popular, in fact, in Russia in the period. So um, a piece that I mentioned called Rails, um, which was a, an evocation of a train, was played for a factory audience who supposedly liked it better than Beethoven. A um, report said that they found it aroused contagious emotions among the audience. Proletarian masses for whom machine oil is mother's milk have a right to demand music consonant with our era, not the music of the bourgeois salon, which belongs to the time of the early locomotive. <laughs> now, we often forget that uh, Sergei Prokofiev, who we all think of as kind of a master of wit and charm, um, who had fled to Paris by this time, he was also, by this point, writing this kind of music. It's not often played, but this is what he was writing at this period. Um, it's loud, it's mechanistic, it's almost gleefully monstrous. Though we hear ballets like Romeo and Juliet and Cinderella all the time, we don't really think of his 1926 ballet, Pas d'Acier, like a pas de deux, but a step of steel. It's a ballet about a factory. Um, and, but uh, even so, he thought that that would put him in good with the Soviet authorities. But when he had it performed in, um, 
in the Soviet Union. The dancers complained they couldn't tell whether the workers were communist workers or capitalist workers. So they weren't really, like, I guess if they were drawing a wage, they danced differently or something. I don't know. Anyway, the uh, Russian Association of Proletarian Musicians said the orchestra must become like a factory. And there were, in fact, symphonies written just for factories. That is to say, you would have timings for things like the, the uh, factory whistles being pulled, a machine starting up, another machine starting up, so that they'd, they would be in kind of rhythmic displacement. So um, that kind of experiment was happening. Now, writers were also fascinated by the new mechanical world. We've talked about uh, prose writers. We've talked about poets. We've talked about visual artists. We've talked about musicians. But um, prose writers as well were writing about this kind of thing. Um, whoop. Here, let me. Um, Yuri Oleshia, who is the one in the middle, this by the way is, uh, Olga, uh, is Bulgakov, who wrote Master and Margarita. But Yuri Oleshia wrote a uh, uh, wonderful novel called Envy, which is a cubist novel about the new world supplanting the sad sack, corrupt old world. It's an insane comedy about a never-do-well parasite jockeying to stay at a powerful man's house, but hating all the clean young things who seem so full of promise around him. Um, and it also has an inventor walking around claiming that he has created an elusive automaton named Ophelia who is going to transform the world. And Yuri Olesha is a great example of how the avant-garde movement played out in prose. The subject matter is concerned with modernity and the future, um, but it's written almost in the mode of a uh, fantasy or a fairy tale. There's a strong absurdist touch which kind of uh, grows out of the tradition of Gogol. Stories like uh, The Nose by Gogol or The Overcoat, if you've read those. Um, Nabokov, I think it was, said once that um, we all crawled out of Gogol's overcoat, um, which I guess he couldn't really say we all crawled out of Gogol's nose. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so anyway, but there's a kind of a blankness of character or a flatness of character, like a fairy tale. There's an emphasis on the grotesque in this kind of writing. There are inclusions of snippets of newspaper uh, advertisements and uh, headlines, that kind of thing. That composer, Alexander Mosolov, actually, his song cycles are um, advertisements set to music as if they were poetry. Um, the, these books include official speech. And also, there's very clipped sentences. There's a lack of emphasis on, on cause and effect. But there's also this anarchic rebelliousness. So oddly enough, in um, Olesha's Envy, it is the people who long for the old world of the deep Russian soul who are both corrupt and yet who are the real revolutionaries, the ones seen as dangerous by the party. The rest of the world is about youth and success and order and materialism. And, but um, the, uh, whereas the characters who are trapped in the ways of the old world who he's weirdly sympathetic to, they can only dream of being machines. One of them says, I want to be a machine. I want to be proud of my work, proud of the fact that I'm working. You know, to be indifferent to everything but work. I've begun to envy machines. That's what it is. Am I not as good as a machine? <laughs> so these deeply corrupt souls, unable to perform as cogs in the Soviet machine, are Olesha's anti-heroes. So it's a fantastic example of a Soviet fantasy that isn't fantasy. This, uh, this feels like this is going on and off. This, uh, the mic. The mic. Yeah. No? OK. Um, the most famous example of this fairy tale dream style, though, almost like Chagall's painting in words, is Bulgakov's Master and Margarita, which some of you have probably read. It's a story of a, a devil coming to Moscow with a giant cat in tow. Um, and it, um, the, and I'm, so uh, a good crystallization of these techniques, one of the most absurd of the Russians is this guy, Daniel Harms. And our very own Dee Dee Robinson has, in fact, illustrated Daniel Harms. You can look at her, uh, at her uh, book version of one of his tales. And, uh, and in fact, she has brought the originals of the art, if you want to take a look at that afterwards. So um, Harms was not very well known in his, uh, in his life as a writer. Most of his writings had to be circulated in secret. He was mainly known as a children's book writer. Um, and I'm just going to read two of his very short stories for you right now. Blue Notebook number 10. There was a red-headed man 
who had no ears or eyes. He didn't have hair either, so he was called a redhead arbitrarily. <laughs> he couldn't talk because he had no mouth. He didn't have a nose either. He didn't even have arms or legs. He had no stomach. He had no back, no spine. He didn't have any insides at all. There was nothing. So we don't even know who we're talking about. We better not talk about him anymore. <laughs> Here's another one called Tumbling Old Women. Because of her excessive curiosity, one old woman tumbled out of her window, fell, and shattered to pieces. Another old woman leaned out to look at the one who'd shattered, but out of excessive curiosity, also tumbled out of her window, fell, and shattered to pieces. Then a third old woman tumbled from her window, and a fourth, and a fifth. When the sixth old woman tumbled out of her window, I got sick of watching them and walked over to Maltsev Market where they say a blind man had been given a knit shawl. <laughs> so you can see this, this, once again, there's a kind of a grotesqueness. It's absolute absurdity. Um, there's a kind of meaninglessness. Life is cheap. It can end at any time. It, their death means nothing, which is frankly appropriate for this period. There's, um, you know, in, in, this, in the case of that second story, literally, like, if you watch someone else's downfall, it will be your downfall, you know? So there is this kind of dark sense to these things. Um, there's this extreme, senseless, absurdist violence that can erupt at any moment. The grammar itself downplays cause and effect by being so simplistic. The psychology of the characters is minimalized to a fable-like sketchiness. Writing was absurdist because life itself was full of absurd logic. Death was arbitrary. An impossible bureaucracy loomed over everyone and threatened everyone. So the final uh, person I want to talk about is a, um, a wonderful experimental writer from this period I would really recommend, who is Boris Pilniak who wrote short novels, and I would kind of say that he is more in the tradition of Tolstoy than of Gogol. He is kind of like a cubist Tolstoy, in that he is focusing, he's very lyrical as a writer, but he's also focusing on groups of people and how certain, uh, certain things affect like a group of people. So for example, the plot of his uh, book, of his novel Mahogany, which is really a novella, all of his books are quite short. Mahogany is one of the uh, stories in this collection. The plot of this is that um, uh, two antique dealers come to a backwater town to buy people's old mahogany furniture. And it follows different people in the time those brothers are in town. Now, why is that interesting? That sounds incredibly uninteresting, mahogany furniture. In, uh, it's interesting because imagine what, a what a, a, an antique dealer is dealing with in the 1920s in Russia. Emotions are invested in antiques. These are the last vestiges of a family history that has been knowingly broken apart by the government in the last few years. So the last vestiges of family history and family identity. The break with the past is painful. Seeing everything you know become worthless, even dangerous, because it can mark you as bourgeois. Families who used to own whole houses are now living with their whole family stuffed in one room. Um, the bells in the village are being destroyed by communist workers. So in a, in a sense, by looking at antique dealers, he gets to look at the whole way that people are dealing with the destruction of the past. Pilniak's prose is not like Harms's. It is not clipped. Instead, it is lyrical and expansive, but still cubist in some ways. Um, and I'll do uh, one sample. Notice how headlong it is, how it charges forward with a disorienting swiveling of focus from thing to thing. And it's also fascinated with the new, um, especially with, uh, with cars and transportation. But here is his example of evening, or uh, his uh, description of evening falling. Um, if the day of work, fog, cues, reception rooms, solemn quiet of high-ceilinged bookkeeping halls, the chirping of the looms and cotton and wool mills, the thunder of hammers in factories and foundries, the whistles of trains departing and in motion, the roar of buses and automobiles, the prattle of streetcar bells, telephone bells, doorbells, the whining of the radio, the day of the city machine of people, men, women, children, old folk, mature people, if we look ahead, 
and replace the labor, the day of labor and business with the evening, as time did, piling the day with twilight, spilling into the streets the light of street lamps, which in the drizzle look like weeping eyes, destroying the sky. Then in the evening, tens of thousands of people made their way into cinemas, theaters, variety shows, open stages, taverns, and beer parlors. There in the places of entertainment, all sorts of things were shown in tangling time, space, and countries. They showed Greeks unlike any that have ever existed, Assyrians unlike any that have ever existed, unreal Jews, Americans, Englishmen, Germans, oppressed unreal Chinese, Russian workers, Furthermore, um, an ability to speak well or speak poorly was displayed. Good or bad legs, arms, and backs, and chests were shown. Once again, like see, almost like a cubist painting, the way that the body is sort of disassembled in this headlong description. Um, the ability to dance and sing well or poorly exhibited. And furthermore, they showed all aspects of love and various amorous intrigues, such as seldom, if ever, occurred in everyday life. Dressed in their best, people sat in rows, looked, listened, applauded, and streaming down the brightly lit stairs in, of the theaters into the wet streets, comment, uh, commented hurriedly, always trying to be clever. Then the streets emptied to find rest in the night, and at night, past midnight, at the hour when in villages the first roosters crow, in houses, in beds, husbands and wives and lovers, mostly lonely couples, engaged in what animals, birds, and insects engage in at dawn and at sunset. So it's a very beautiful lyrical style. And he often, for example, it's, it's very musical. He literally has um, refrains that will be repeated through one of these novellas and that kind of thing. I really, really, um, I really uh, recommend him. That is from a story called The Tale of the Unextinguished Moon, which proved to be his uh, undoing. It was a story about uh, a couple of um, uh, high ups in the government who decide they need to get rid of a particular general who is, uh, who is vying for power. So they arrange for him to have a, um, an unnecessary uh, surgical operation where he is then killed. Now the problem with Pilniak writing this story is that that was actually true. Um, Stalin had actually done that. So um, he tried to conceal Stalin's um, identity by having the character who clearly is Stalin say, I hate smoking pipes, <laughs> thinking that would do it. But um, unfortunately, he gave uh, the guy a mustache. And as Shostakovich later remarked, Pilniak might have lived if he had only not put in the mustache. <laughs> so this story would come back later to destroy Pilniak. So now it's time, in closing, to turn a corner. Let's come back to Earth for a minute from the world of experimentation. The future had not arrived. Soviet industry and agriculture collapsed in the wake of the revolution. The focus on the science fiction future was so important because the fact, in fact, the present was miserable. World War I, then the revolution, then the Russian Civil War meant years of starvation. So even though Vasily Kandinsky was high up in the People's Commissariat of Enlightenment, for example, his son still star his infant son, or like three or four years old son, still starved to death. Just as Lenin's new economic policy got agricultural and industrial production back to their pre-war levels, ideological and political battles erased that policy and everything collapsed again. Lenin himself was not as fond of the futurists or of the arts at all as he pretended. Uh, he called the futurists the so-called intellectuals, the lackeys of capitalism, who see themselves as the nation's brain. They are not a brain, they are shit. That is what he said in private about them, though he praised them in public. On music, he was coming out of a uh, concert of uh, Beethoven with Maxim Gorky. And um, he said to Gorky, I cannot listen to music often. It affects my nerves. I want to say amiable stupidities and stroke the heads of people who can create such beauty in this filthy hell. But today is not the time to stroke people's heads. Today, head, hands descend to split skulls open. Split them open ruthlessly. So there's this kind of struggle going on within um, communism about what is, how are the arts going to be used? Um, on the one hand, you have these avant-garde people. On the other, you have people who want to have everyone singing massed songs 
propaganda songs, which of course the workers are not super happy about singing mass propaganda songs. What they want is to be able to dance to jazz, Western jazz, which has been forbidden them by everyone in the government, saying that jazz is, is cheap and capitalist and bourgeois. Um, so you have this kind of push and pull going, and it gets increasingly uh, disastrous with uh, people accusing each other of being counter-revolutionary because of the words that they write or the music that they write. For example, uh, Nikolai Roslovets, who's called the Schoenberg of Moscow, because he's a sort of very experimental composer, um, he was actually of peasant stock. He taught himself to read, to write, and to play the violin by ear. So then he comes across, he creates this own kind of, his own experimental style, and he's super pissed off that then people attack him and say he's not proletarian enough. So he says, I am bourgeois enough to consider the proletariat the rightful heir of all previous culture and entitled to the best of music. But um, people like him did not survive. Basically, the uh, Stalin's five-year plan suddenly forced collectivization of the farms across the country. You had thousands, no, not thousands, but hundreds of uprisings all over the country. You had the starting of the mass starvation in Ukraine, which we're still seeing the effects of today in terms of the relations between those countries. Uh, starvation caused by farm collectivization, which probably caused the death of uh, roughly, we don't know, but probably around three million people through starvation in the course of about two and a half years. Um, and this period therefore saw the rise of socialist realism, which was going to, to crush the avant-garde. Socialist realism, I always wondered why it was called realism, because the idea is you have to say nice, happy things. But here's the thing. Their argument is, you have to talk about the real. We don't want to hear about any more stuff happening in outer space. We don't want to hear any more stuff about like, you know, sort of these sort of spiritual, personal things. We want to hear about reality, but remember, Reality is super happy right now because we're all communist and on the way to a perfect future. So it's this weird dialectic, a very deceptive dialectic where you're supposed to write about the truth, but the truth has to be positive because of course the truth is positive and you are a traitor if you don't think so. So the early 30s saw the rise of that socialist realism and it also saw the death of experiment. So suddenly you had to watch what you said. Almost everyone I've talked about so far in this talk was arrested, executed, or forced to commit suicide in the next 10 years. All of them were silenced in one way or another. In Mayakovsky's words, they were, quote, forced to step on their own song's throat. So Yuri Alesha never wrote another novel after Envy. He complained that he wasn't able to write heroically in the uh, socialist realist style. Nikolai Roslovets, the Schoenberg of Moscow, was forced to issue a retraction of his own music. Uh, he began to write in a completely different style, casting away all his old experimental notions. Um, nonetheless, the secret police were actually still gathering information for a case against him when he happened to suffer a stroke that paralyzed him and they decided it wasn't worth it. He died during World War II. Alexander Mosolov was uh, thrown into a work, a labor camp, a, uh, the, the Gulag, for uh, a sentence to eight years for anti-revolutionary activity. Um, when he finally did get out, he would introduce himself as uh, the deceased composer Mosolov because he felt he'd been so broken. And his music fundamentally changed in its character after that time. Um, Sergei Prokofiev even, um, who uh, had returned in Russia in the 1930s at exactly the wrong time, as Shostakovich said, like a chicken landing in the soup, um, he also found it advisable to turn away from the loud, angular experiments of the 1920s. Just like Mosolov and Roslovets, he started to consciously depoliticize his music by writing soft fairy tale ballets and pieces for children that no one would pay any attention to, like Peter and the Wolf. Um, he hardly protested when his ex-wife, Lena, was arrested, tortured for several months until she confessed crimes she had not committed, and then sentenced to 12 years uh, hard labor. Boris Pilniak, uh, the cubist Tolstoy, was also forced to write a retraction of his own work, but apparently Stalin never forgot the jab in the tale of the unextinguished moon. On October 28, 1937, Pilniak had several friends over to celebrate his little son's third birthday, including, in fact, Boris Pasternak, author of Dr. Zhivago. That night, NKVD agents burst into his apartment, dragged Pilniak away, and accused him of absurdly of being a spy 
for both the Germans and the Japanese. He pled guilty and was shot in the back of the head. Um, Mikhail Bulgakov, um, who wrote the, the, the author of science fiction fables, things like Master and Margarita. He couldn't publish the book during his lifetime. He had a, um, a fatal kidney disease, so he said he was going to publish it anyway. And his friends said, please don't, because we're still alive. Um, it, so it, in fact, was not published until decades after his death. Um, Daniel Harms, the spinner of absurdist fables and stories for children, was arrested about the same time in the late 1930s. For the next couple of decades, his wife continued to write to him in prison. No one told her that he had already frozen to death in an insane asylum. Um, Zevalad Meyerhold, the futurist director of plays by Vladimir Mayakovsky and others, spoke out publicly against the persecution of artists and was, of course, arrested soon after. Um, he was tortured extensively and forced to give false evidence against many of his closest friends. In an act of incredible bravery, during a pause in his months of torture, he retracted his statement and said, they are not guilty, I am the only one who is guilty. He was taken down into the basement of the Lubyanka, the secret police headquarters, and shot. Meanwhile, his wife, um, Zeneda Rake was lured back to her apartment where thugs broke in, stabbed her 27 times, gouged out her eyes, and then slipped out over the balcony. And Mayakovsky himself, the wunderkind of the revolution, as the self-appointed messiah of futurism, he started to spend a lot of time in Paris buying sort of like Parisian shirts, silk ties for himself. He bought a sports car, one of the only cars on the streets of Moscow. This obviously was going to eventually make him a target. Um, he had a fling with a white Russian princess. Mayakovsky himself only recognized this contradiction between collectivism and his own narcissistic individualism when, at the end of the 1920s, the Soviet government started to treat him like any other citizen. They refused to give him a, give him a, give him a visa to leave the country. Like anyone else, they also refused to give him any reason he wasn't allowed to leave. Suddenly, he started to see the walls he had helped build close around him. His character in The Bedbug, who wakes up in the future, says this, what is all this? What did we fight for? Why did we shed our blood if I can't dance to my heart's content? And I'm supposed to be the leader of the new society. These words could be Mayakovsky's own. One day, after he spent the morning as he usually did, trying to convince a woman to leave her husband for him, <laughs> he shot himself in the heart. Um, Mayakovsky was crushed by the contradictions of self and society, collective and individual. Perhaps this is why the experiments of Russian futurism could not survive. They were both ar ar anarchic and individualistic, the outpourings and dreams of eccentric creators. It was only the illusion afforded by an anarchic epoch that allowed them to seem briefly like the voice of a nation. We, of course, have our own tensions here between individual and collective, but they're very different. The Soviet avant-garde of the 1920s remains one of the most fascinating and creative periods in the history of the arts. These works are urgent, written in danger, out of necessity. In this country, we have grown complacent about the arts. They seem to be a kind of side dish or relish on the main meat of capital acquisition. It is important to remember that people have died for the arts, as poet, poet Osip Mandelstam famously said, nowhere in the world is poetry as important as it is in Russia. Nowhere else does so many people die of it. But just as important, we need to remember that the arts saved lives in these places too. Even as manuscripts were circulated in secret, they allowed people to see a way through impossible times. This is why the risks were worth it. If the arts were not important, people would not have given their lives for them. The arts gave people's lives shape. They taught people the lessons of fortitude, of compassion, and unbounded creativity. They can remind us of those things in our newly dangerous world. They can remind us of how the future can change in a day. Thank you. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, I can answer them. Yeah. Yeah, um, 
if you want to hear about Shostakovich, since we're in a capitalist country, why don't you go out and buy this book? <laughs> Symphony for the City of the Dead, Dmitry Shostakovich and the Siege of Leningrad by M.T. Anderson, available at Bear Pond Books. <laughs> Thank you, sir. He's not a plant, not a plant. <laughs> yes. Um, it's also very interesting because it helps you understand the DP mentality. DP, yeah. displaced person. Oh, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. World War II. Right. Because it, yes. it just explains everything. Right, yeah. And I mean, yeah, like the, um, and I think the whole sense of the Russian mentality, like uh, Nadezhda Mandelstam, the poet Mandelstam's wife, wrote these beautiful memoirs. And one of the things she says, and I think this is really important to understanding Russia now, is she's like, you have to understand that for at least a generation, the whole idea of compassion was burned out of people. Like that was, compassion was death. That meant that you were open to be destroyed. And she was, she was like, um, I think that her term is something like, it was as forgotten as the woolly mammoth. It was extinct. And I think, you know, a, a whole society can be traumatized. A si society can have a post-traumatic, you know, sort of like uh, uh, attitude. And that, I think, explains a lot of um, how Russia acts now in some ways. Uh, it is a fundamentally traumatized society. Uh, yes, Didi. to the performer, you know, play this like yeah. four o'clock in the afternoon right. kind of things, that he was coming out of a tradition. I thought he was just a very unique nutcase. <laughs> yeah. He wasn't. He well, was no, he was a unique nutcase. There's no <laughs> question that <laughs> Satie was... was yeah, I mean, that's one of the neat things is that, like, you can see all of these connections in particular between Paris yeah. and, uh, and St. Petersburg, um, you know, Petrograd, Leningrad in this period. Totally, and just like uh, Satie went to um, Le Chat Noir, the black cat, there's a cafe in uh, St. Petersburg that was the center of all this called uh, the Stray Dog. <laughs> so, you know, there you go, just a different animal. Um, yes? I'd just like to put in a plug for Vladimir Melnikov, who was an architect who was, who was a compadre of, of uh, El Lisitsky. But El Lisitsky had a very aristocratic background. Melnikov was a peasant. He went to the technical colleges um, and then became part of the futurist movement. And his work, because architecture lasts, his work um, is still exists. Ow. His work still exists in and around Moscow and um, across the country. He survived Stalinist purges by um, teaching in far off places like Samarkand and Tajikistan and all those other places. He went out there. But his house, I was there in 2003. His house is the last privately owned house in Moscow. It is round. It is some of the most bizarre features in it. Um, the bed, for instance, in the master bedroom is in the center of the room and is a concrete pedestal. So, you know, but his, son, his son was still living there. And, um, and Sally has a book on Melnikov, if you want to take a look to see what his... Pages are marked where the buildings that I visited are still excellent. Yeah, very, very cool. Yeah. Yeah, he, he also was the first one to, to, you know, you're all familiar with stadiums that have concrete that support the bleachers. He was the first one to really create that form and build mm. it. I'm not sure you can really sell people on that, but, you know, <laughs> good try. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. I totally, I think that he's an amazing figure. I love his work. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, like, the, there, there are a few things good about the Soviet Union, but um, maybe this is one of them, the um, creation of bleacher seating. But there is also the fact that they, um, that they, they banned the, um, the saxophone. I think that's one of their other great accomplishments. <laughs> yeah, that's an enemy. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. or maybe very romanticized country, mm -hmm. was there a movement for a new kind of dress other than military uniform? Oh, yeah. No, totally. And I mean, in particular, because you had these, like, this beautiful high design work being done where people were taking cubist forms and then turning that into, um, into cloth and being very proud of the fact that that is cloth that, um, 
that a collective had made and that it was not going to be something someone from the West would wear. Yeah, but, then, uh, but it is totally true that you still had this weird collision that a lot of people are still dressing like it is, you know, like it's 1920 anyplace else. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah. Um, yes. Um, I wasn't aware that an effort was made to destroy all the bells. Mm. And um, uh, it brought to mind the scene at the end of um, our prosecution movie on Zerubia where it shows how the bell was created. Oh. And so that just really kind of compounds the oh. thought of, you know, what went into making the bell. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, super weird uh, local connection there is that um, those of you who are from, as I am, Calus, know that the um, eastern, East Calus used to be called Moscow and Moscow Woods. And the reason is because there once they dropped a, um, a millstone there and they said it was as loud as the, uh, as the breaking of a Russian bell in Moscow. And weirdly enough, that stuck, and that's the reason it's called Moscow and Moscow Mills, Moscow Woods Road, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, and I should also mention, like, you couldn't hear it, unfortunately, but that Obokhov piece is actually called the Bells in the, in the Great Distance. So it actually is an invocation of Bells as well. Yeah. Um, did Howard Norman have his hand up a second ago? I was thinking about the word heroism, that that was a gigantic debate when all the Yiddish writers who were rounded up and murdered by Stalin in the famous, which you don't know all about, they, one of them said, you know, you're indicting us for basing our writing on ancient Jewish folk tales as if you're basing your sensibilities on um, something that isn't realism. Right. But to them, it was realism. That was history, those folk tales. Totally. And they, so the Lubyanka prison ended up to be the greatest library, really, because everything that was under indictment, including Solzhenitsyn's work, all ended up as uh, forensic evidence. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. when, when, uh, when uh, 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 Brezhnev opened it up, Thousands of scholars from all around the world could go and see original texts wow. that had been destroyed and so forth. That's one of the amazing paradoxes of that repressive regime, mm. is they actually uh, preserved um, work that would not have been otherwise preserved. And diaries were in there, and too. diaries, including you know. Isaac Babel's diaries. Yeah, yeah. Just, Isaac Babel's diaries uh, are there. Interesting. One, oh, of the, one more question. Okay. Oh, just go, one, uh, one of the um, great com, com, um, collections of stuff that made it out of Russia during that time, um, all the way up through the 30s, is in the Getty Library in LA, because a lot of the expo, expats ended up in LA. And the Getty has a whole catalog of work, especially mm. visual work. Um, that's, that's great. There, in the Getty stuff. Well, thank you all very much. Thanks for coming.